Here it is. Uh, preach the word. Be ready in season 4-2. Uh, season and out of season. This is 2 Timothy 4-2. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned to aside to fables. But you, be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Okay? That's what you're talking about. 2 Timothy... That's exactly right. And that's, you know, there's somebody else, and I don't want to point him out because he's not in the class today, but uh, he does it every time we are doing something together, and I just bring up Joel Steen, this is what he does right here. <laughs> Tingling ears. Every time. It's just, you know. So anyway, um, but I won't bring up his name because he can speak for himself on that, or I can bring him up when he's in here. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, that, that's, you know, and when it says, just so you know, when it says in Timothy, or anywhere in the New Testament, the last days, or in the end times. He's speaking about from the time of Christ's ascension until whenever he comes again. This is the entire last times, and there have been people with itching ears all along. If you read the book of 1, 2, and 3 John, which we're doing in the daily devotionals right now, you'll see that there are people in there already, already trying to usurp John, who lived with the Lord. He was the guy that's bringing the message of the Lord to him, right? He's the last apostle. And there are already people that are trying to get him excommunicated from the church. And that's what happens in churches all the time. You get a preacher that's preaching the word of God, they try to get him out. Because numbers are going to say at a certain level when you are preaching God's word. They're not going to go down. I assure you, the people that are there are going to be faithful. But if you want a big congregation... With a lot of people, you, yeah, just have somebody that will come in and preach that says nothing. Just, just a flowery sermon that doesn't say anything. That is what you're going to get. And numbers are going to increase, no doubt about it. And the church is going to feel oh so satisfied with itself. And it is going to go way astray of where it belongs. So it, 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 it's a choice that we have to make. Are we going to go to a church that, you know, the pastor probably has a second job? but he really loves the Lord and he's really willing to preach. Now, that's not to say that all pastors that are good have a second job. There are some, you know, you get some guys in these big churches around America that are really, really good pastors, but they're the exception, not the rule. Most of the really big churches have people that just walk around on stage and they just hold their Bible up and they, they say all these things that don't say, ah, oh, ah, oh, I just watch that CTN and I get so mad. Five minutes an hour, I turn it on and here they are. Here's... Here's uh, Richard Roberts' wife, right? You know, Richard, the son of Oral Roberts, oh. Richard Roberts. His wife, never mind that she sits here and she'll say, and God's word says, you know, and she's talking about something that has nothing to do with at all with the context of what this verse is. And it's always about money, how they need to send money into her. Always, okay? And she's, God's words, and every word is important. And this version says it this way. And every word is very important. I feel like just going to that thing in 1 Timothy and saying, well, it says that you're not to teach or have authority over men. What do you think? About oh, well, I you know, I just wonder what her answer is going to be. Because she's saying these things, but only select verses, only the ones that get their ministry money. And I, I always sit there when I first turn them on, Richard or whatever her name is, and I start counting. When is money going to be introduced? Usually I don't even have to count. Usually it's already the subject, but normally it's about eight seconds before the actual point is you need to be faithful in your offerings. Eight seconds. I mean, that's about it. it you know, if people are in this, they're going to be faithful in their offerings anyway. You know, that's all there is to it. Whatever their offering is, if it's 1% or 50%, they will be faithful in it. Okay? I'm not a big percent kind of guy, but... <sighs> Okay, please go ahead before I keep going on. <laughs> Making bricks without straw. Afterward, Mo Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Okay, wow. Verse 2 is really heavy. First, he says, who is the Lord? He has been identified as L-O-R-D. Whatever, however they termed him to Pharaoh, Pharaoh got the name, and he repeated it back to them. Who is the Lord, all right? That I should obey his voice. Okay, this guy is standing around a temple with 
gods all over the place. He's got the god of the sun. He's got the god of the Nile. He's got the god of, you know, the frog. Every, when we get to these ten plagues, every one of them was a god of Egypt. And that is why they were specifically directed at those plagues. The plague of the Nile. To prove that God is above the Nile. They have the God of uh, uh, the sun. He blots out the sun. And you're going to see this. These ten deities in Egypt are the ten deities that God directly attacks. The last one is the firstborn because that, you know, Pharaoh is the deity or the God of Egypt. And his son died, which he's the the. Uh, inheritor of the throne, and therefore God is even above Pharaoh himself. Okay, so that's what's going on there, and we'll get there in a minute. But he's got all these gods around me. He says, this is just another God. You know, I don't know him, and I'm not going to obey. That's what's going on there. And then he says here, I do not know the Lord. You know what? How many times do we see people say that in our own lives? I don't know the Lord. You know, I don't know the Lord. Well, guess what? You really ought to see if he is who he says he is. Right? I mean, I don't know Buddha. That would be just like me saying, I don't know Buddha. No big deal. But I really ought to check out, is he real? Is Buddha real? I don't know Allah. Okay, maybe I'm wrong is what I'm saying. Maybe I'm wrong in whatever station I'm in. I'm not saying as a Christian. I'm saying in whatever station I am in life. I don't know Krishna or Vishnu or any of these other gods of the Hindus. Maybe they are right. And that's why, remember the first three hours of this class, we talked about the nature of God. There can only be one God, and he has certain qualities that are identifiable. And we can know those as human beings without this book. That's why it's so important to say, I don't know the Lord. Well, let me show you what he's like. Now you determine, does Vishnu match him? Does Allah match him? Does Buddha match him? Which God matches him? Or does no God match him? Is he just... You know, the, the deist God that wind up the universe and left. We need to determine these things. And I can assure you that what we can know just by using our heads without the Bible, this is him right here. So keep that in mind. When somebody says, I do not know the Lord, we together are being trained in learning. Because I learn as much from you every week as I, you learn from me. I assure you of that. We are learning together because we are in God's word the nature of God and who he is, and we should be able to defend it to somebody. It doesn't mean they're going to respond, but at least we can put them into the position where they ha now have the information necessary to say, I know the Lord, right? That's, there you go. That's why it's so important to stay in the Bible and to hear sermons that are theologically sound, not watery, not, you know, mishmash sermons, because most people come to church that one time a week, right? The rest of the people, and I'm talking about in this class and in Saturday and the Wednesday night class, which I don't do, the people that come for Bible study, or what, what do you think the percentage is? I don't know. Seriously, though, what, uh, very small. Then there's overlap in this class and in the Saturday class, and I'm certain that some of you come on Wednesday night. Do, does anybody here come on Wednesday night? Okay, there you go. So there's even overlap there. And then maybe more come on Sunday morning before church, but still, you add up all of the extra things that we do at this church to get people to know God's word, and I bet you it is less than 5% of the people. What do you think, Dave? You're, you're in the church. I, I, I'd say 5%. And that, that breaks my heart personally, because I have made the offer already. I'll come any day of the week and have a class. And here we have Monday morning, 15 people, sometimes 20 or 30, Saturday afternoon, usually about this size. You know, it doesn't get as big as our biggest classes on Monday. And then whatever we have on Wednesday, and I used to come, but seeing how I'm not teaching and, you know, I, I have things that I can do, you know, for Sunday, something I'm to do on Sundays that most of you know about. But uh, uh, I, I can better use that time. But it breaks my heart. It really, really breaks my heart that people aren't willing to simply do this. And you know they're not doing it on their own. I don't care anybody says, oh, I read the Bible every day. I just, man, I find that hard to believe. If they're not in here, I find it hard to believe that they're really reading the Bible. You know, uh, maybe they're getting their Bible from Joel Osteen, so. Yeah. Anyway, okay, I do not know the Lord, but we're, we're finding out about him, okay? Oh, I'm almost in tears right now. I get thinking about this, and it just breaks my heart, so. <sighs> okay, verse 3. <sighs> then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three-day journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with 
sword. Okay. Notice how they change the terminology throughout the Bible. We've talked about this before, but it's a good point to remember. Who is the Lord? And then in verse 3 it says, the God of the Hebrews. Okay? And then it says, the Lord our God. This is all interchangeable in some way or another. In other words, the, the same term is being applied to the same person, if you want to call it that. Three persons in one essence, uh, the, the Trinity. But anyway, the Elohim is the word here. The God of the Hebrews. So they have already said, this is our God. Now, once again, Pharaoh can say, well, he's not my God. Yeah. Right? He can say, he's not my God. Well, you yeah, ought to figure this out. What then is the purpose of being called the God of the Hebrews? Is that God is doing something in human history through a specific group of people. Okay, and that's important to understand because God is still the God of the whole world. Paul makes that claim in Romans. Is he not the God of the whole earth? And, you know, David does in the Psalms as well. So we have him as the God of the whole world, but he is specifically identifying himself as the one being revealed through this particular people. Do you see the logic there? And why is he doing that? Why is God going through the Hebrew people? There's chosen people, but why? Why has he chosen a specific group of people? Remember we started at Adam, we went through Seth. Because of Abraham's faithfulness. Okay, well, yes, but why did he choose Abraham? And then the Hebrew people through Abraham. Why did he do that? What is the goal? Oh, to, to have the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, spread the, to spread the... Yeah, I can't say gospel. Well, to spread the news of the one true God and ultimately to do what? It's a, oh, to be well, the man that brings Jesus. The Messiah. To bring, I am the God of the Hebrews. I am working through humankind in order to, as she said, be a light to the nations. They never did fulfill that commission. Jonah went up and he, he you know, he did it under, uh, you know, uh, pain, I guess, duress, but you know, very few times did they get outside of Israel, but the idea was that even if they fail at their mission, he is working towards a specific goal, and as Pat says, it is to bring Jesus into the world as the light to the whole world, okay? That's what's going on here. So when he identifies himself as the God of the Hebrews, he is initially setting up the stage that I have chosen a people. As you said, through Abraham, but the goal is the Messiah. Okay, so that's what we need to keep in context because he, they could have said, well, he's the God of the whole world, you know. They didn't do that in this case. He spoke to a ruler of another nation and he says, he's our God. And guess what he's going to do? He is going to demonstrate, rather than us making the claim, he is going to demonstrate that he is superior to your gods. Right? Okay. And the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. What's that mean? Get back. <laughs> Get back to your labor. Get back to your work. Yeah. yeah, but, you know, they were, because of who they were, they were bearers of burdens. Now, um, I, I'm not going to give you any more than I absolutely have to with this because, um, you know, I, I was a Mason for 20 years. And uh, uh, a couple other people in here have been Masons. But anyway, I was a Mason for 20 years. And they have different levels in Masonry. And the first one is called um, the Apprentice Mason, then the Fellow Craft, and then the Master. And these are all things that you can know without violating your oath, not to say anything. But anyway, the lowest ones wore their apron, the, the Masons, in a certain way. They had it fo the flap folded up. Okay, in other words, you got this apron and it's got this flap and they fold it up. All right, and then the next one, it's folded to the side. And then the Master Masons is down. Okay, just so you know this. All right, why would you fold your flap up? Okay, this is, this is a part of your working... Uh, here, let me borrow this. This is part of your working... Uniform, okay, right? Just like cowboys wear chaps, okay? The lowest level has this thing up. Why would he do this? Just to a certain, certain level. Well, no, no, no. For, think of it actually working because a mason is a person that really works. I'm not talking about masonry in a lodge. This is just symbolic of a real mason. No, 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 no. There you go, right? You're protecting your clothes. That's what they are laborers. And then you get the second one. It's folded. I'm not going to fold it and ruin it, but it's up like this. Why would they have it like this? What would be the next level of a person that's working in a quarry, for example? First person is just simply picking up the stuff and he's carrying it. The next level. Kind of distribute it or mix no. There you go. 
And what do you do? How do you do that? He said cutting the stones. How do you cut a stone? Right? You're down here like this. Okay? So you got this out of your way so you can bend down. 